Well, here we are again with the uh, Sober Social Distancing series. This episode is with um, someone I now refer to as a new lifelong friend. Her name is Cindy Blum. And Cindy and her husband Dan have a company called EB Rooster Guitar. I met Cindy, I don't know, what, six months ago, seven months ago? Cindy lost her son. Cindy and Dan lost their son. Um, their daughter lost her brother. Uh, six years ago last week. In fact, it was just a couple of days before the anniversary of, of uh, Eric's death that we sat down and had this Zoom conversation. Um, this is going to be a two-parter because we just, we got into the deep end of the pool and we swam around for a while. Get this one into your bones. This is Cindy Blum with EB Rooster Guitar. We get a lot of people on May 1st saying, hey, you know, thinking about you today. And the people who really know us well know that April 30 was the horrible day. Right. Horrible day. Right. Because right. we were going down a really good road and April 30, everything started unraveling right. Um, right. for him. And we were watching him unravel. Yeah. And we knew enough about where he'd been and about the substance use disorder and about the rape trauma and about the mental illness that we knew this was, this could very well be a hospice day. But what does a hospice day look like when someone's battling substance use disorder, relapse and trauma? I mean, it just looks so different. And I think that's what people don't get. When you have a loved one dying of cancer or whatever else you don't ever come in with a hero cape and go whoo i could have done this one thing and right. it would have saved their life right that's the big difference i didn't my cape wasn't going to be any more effective april 30 2014 than it would have been if i would come into somebody dying of lymphoma right or dying of coronavirus right I, my cape doesn't work but then there still are people who just don't understand and go, well, you know what? They were junkies and it was a moral behavior. And I, I'm trying to work with families that have given up hope on their living addict, their living son or daughter. And right. I'm like, if where there's breath, there's hope for life. Right. And the hardest thing is to hope. You know, we were at that point. I think that was the hardest thing about that day. That's the thing that got us spinning was we thought we were stringing days together and had a really good treatment plan in place that was the best that we'd done in so long. Right. And then we're like, oh, and then the next minute he's gone. So when there's grief from this kind of stuff, it's the weirdest grief because it just has all of these pieces tied to it that you're thinking nobody, nobody knows that. I can't call a friend that goes, hey, how did you handle when your loved one overdosed and you're reading those reports? And I mean, it's, it's horrific because it's just such a weird, weird world that you think, how did we get here? Yeah. Six years later, we're still going. You're still asking. How did we get here? Yeah. Now, we're not a mess every day. We're not a hot mess every day. This week, it's weird. This week, we're kind, the energy is, we're all a little bit porcupine-ish and the pain kind of goes sideways and none of us, I wish we could all grieve exactly the same and we have this nice hallmark check moment. Yeah, just do a checklist. <laughs> or, and sometimes, you know, I'm doing better and then the next person's doing crappy. So that means you've got a whole week of crap because at some point somebody's cycling into a crappy mode. And I'm mm -hmm. like, that's the best news I got for you yeah. is you won't feel crappy, but probably somebody in your house will. That's normal. That's what I want to tell people. That's normal. And that's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Feel them, feel your feelings. It's okay. It's just stinks. And some days the best place to go is Larkspur. And when I saw you sitting there, I thought, 
man, I wish I would have thought about that yesterday. I should have gone. Because <laughs> sometimes that's the best thing to do, is to just go. So EB Rooster Guitar is a uh, guitar company in Williamson County. And Dan, you know, he had, I mean, over a quarter of a century of experience with, uh, with um, uh, repairs and working on guitars, vintage guitars, high quality, expensive guitars, and took that experience and turned it into building his own guitars uh, for EB Rooster. The selling of these guitars, they do take some of the profits and put them toward different organizations to help fight against mental, uh, mental health issues, um, substance use disorder, trauma, and things of that nature. Trying to keep Eric alive, fighting with him against his illness, not fighting him, but fighting with him against his illness, took a lot of hours in a day. Over 14 years of, of addiction and mental illness and all of that, there were a lot of hours in a day. When he died, and this is, and this is we had way time. too much free time. We had so much free time because we're like, oh my gosh, now what do you do? Yeah. So part of us was like, where do we use up that energy? There was a lot of energy after he died that had to go somewhere. And it could either gone in some really creepy places. And we decided, you know what, we need to use it in a way. now. Were we using it in a way that actually is saving the world because of all the money? No, I'm like, look at, with the flood, we don't have enough money to give millions of dollars away. And I'm thinking, we're not even giving anything away. But what we are giving away is a story and hopefully a battle against the stigma. Hopefully we're saying, this is a guy who lost this battle on this day and he fought hard. He fought really hard. So, hey, if you play guitar and you want a really good guitar right. that you love, play this one. Right. Because we're just trying to say, hey, when you play this one, think about somebody else out there that's battling this and understand there's a grief story in, in their life. There are so many, I, I mean, addicts and, uh, you know what I mean? mentally yeah. ill, all of it, deal with so much grief on a daily basis. And I'm like, so that's all we do is we got to go, let's level the playing field. Let's start a conversation around something that I believe heals, which is why, which is why we gave one to Rock to Recovery. Because I'm like, I love the fact that that guitar, that Tilly is going in to those sessions at rehab centers yeah. And there is rewiring of the brain happening through something that we made in honor. And that it maybe gave hope to these people saying, you know what, you, you are loved. What's you're that? sitting over there behind your, um, you know, you're sitting over there in front of your iPad, wondering whether or not you're profiting off of your son's death by making guitars. Yeah. I'm sitting over here thinking that you are doing God's work. And I'm over here sitting wondering and worrying about whether or not I'm trying to make a quick buck off of making a documentary about people that have died from substance use disorder. And you're over there thinking that I'm probably doing the right thing. I'm over there thinking that you are presenting the gospel through an educational piece of documentary that may save lives, probably more lives than most um, churches who have been in business for a long time. That's what I believe, because I believe that this, this information has to get out because no one's being taught this. And documentaries, especially now, look at everybody locked down. Now's the best time to have a documentary out there because everybody's, what are they watching? Tiger King? Or they could be watching, you know, yeah. on stigma. Yeah. If, if it teaches us how to love. Right. We may have we may have a chance at this. Right. How do you relate to people that are um, dealing with issues of substance use disorder, dealing with drug addiction, um, mental illness, trauma, things like that, when you don't even know what that is? You don't know what that's like. Um, and I really appreciate what Cindy brings to the table here as she kind of draws those parallels.
because we all compare and contrast. Um, but when it comes to this kind of a thing, comparing and contrasting along with putting moral judgments on it is, uh, is really dangerous. Somebody who's um, using different, uh, more socially accepted ways of acting out, um, which means, you know, high achiever, power hungry, workaholic, uh, all of those things. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, that, those kinds of things, I enabled that in some settings because they were just socially acceptable addictions and socially acceptable. They, they actually worked better for the company. So we love addictions and lifestyle choices when it makes us money and it works as well for the company. I always looked at addiction in a way that we took, we took things that we had no power over and we decided to have control over it <clears throat> one way or the other. I didn't ever put a needle in my arm, right. but I, right. had, I had addictions. And my, the way I dealt with mine made me an excellent church employee the best and they loved it it made me a crappy wife and mom right but you see uh, it you know nobody nobody thinks poorly of me because i brought crap home and shame home and um all of that stuff home to my family system you know i brought stuff home and it, it was the church kind of paid me to to do that and wear a mask and and perform and do whatever so i'm just saying can we have a conversation that just levels the playing field and op opens it up so that we can just be honest yeah. honest about what drives our hearts honest about you know what what makes us who we are you know for me is it what is it is it money is it control is it being liked you know, I mean, all of that stuff goes into the play and then what I do with it ends up, you know, what it looks like and how far, what road I end up going down. I never chose to go down a road um, and I don't have the disease of alcoholism or drug abuse. You know, I just right. don't. Right. I wasn't born with that. I was born with one that gives me double chins, you know, and I tried to get the little thing on Facebook and it didn't work too well. I don't have this at the right angle. She told me how to do it. <laughs> and then there was another lady duct taping her neck back. And I, I was watching that last night and I thought, oh, that would be good. I'll let's, I'll see if that helps with Skip. I'll put a potato chip clip back here. But you know, I mean, all of that noise in our head, what's the difference? Right. Really, what's the difference? That's a lot of crazy noise in my head. If you yeah. got in my head, you wouldn't see it much different than what my son's had looked like right and so so what you're talking about there um is a relatability you know my first night that i went into a meeting i walked in and um and uh <laughs> there's an old timer that that goes to the meeting that i go to and uh when his wife was still alive she's the first person that saw me in the room and she saw me walk in the building and she looks at me and she goes that room right there I didn't know all the rules. I didn't know all the details. I didn't realize that if you, if they find out that it's your first time ever in a meeting, that they're gonna that they're gonna change the format a little bit. I didn't know all of that. Right. And all of a sudden, about three quarters of the way through the meeting, I'm listening to everybody tell their story and give their account and how mm -hmm. they're alcoholics and blah blah blah. And I'm honestly taking inventory through the whole thing. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking at one point, I might have been a little too hasty in my decision to uh, to come in here. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't relate with a lot of this. Like mm -hmm. I've never run down Nolensville Road naked with a beer. Right. That, <laughs> that was literally one of the things said that night. Like I'm sitting uh -huh. there going, "That I don't have that. I don't. I mean, I own a. You had to talk about the fire hydrant. Talk about your cliffhanger. <laughs> Uh, we'll come back next week to uh, finish up this conversation with Cindy because there was just too much stuff in there not to put it all in. Anyway, Cindy's going to be contributing her voice also to our feature-length documentary about stigma. Um, and E.B. Rooster Guitar is going to be a part of that story. 
uh, we'll announce more people that are going to be involved in that project as the weeks continue. Uh, and uh, also let you know about the, uh, the Kickstarter that we're working on getting going. That's a little bit of the announcements that I alluded to last week. And uh, when we get more information, we'll give it to you. Um, stay safe out there, y'all. And um, see you next week.